All right, I am recording, and Kristen, you can go live. Kristen's at so our happy studio, to be actually. <laughs> Hi, we are live on Facebook. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Adam McKinney. It's a, a bit of a takeover here today. Caroline has been, as you may know, <clears throat> excuse me, interviewing artists from all over the place. And in our interview, Caroline, I suggested that we have an opportunity to interview you mm -hmm. um, and to kind of share the resource and continue the circle, make sure and make, making sure that that circle is rotating and keeping moving. So, uh, hey, everybody on Facebook. My name's Adam McKinney. I'm an artist, an educator, an activist based in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I'm a professor of dance at Texas Christian University uh, in Fort Worth. Go Frogs, yeah. And Caroline, as you may know, um, is an alumna. And is that how we first connected, Caroline? Is that how you first learned about me? Yeah, or? yeah pretty much, yes. Yeah, great, amazing. So uh, Caroline, I, I'd like to give you just some time to um, give a sense of who you are. I actually don't know you that well, and I'd like to learn more about you. Yeah, you're probably the perfect person to interview me because you don't know anything, so that's great. We have a yeah. conversation of wherever this may go. So thank you, Adam, for um, turning the tables on me. I appreciate that and putting me on the spot. Um, I was born in Richmond, Virginia. I remember the cul-de-sac we lived in and that's about it. We moved down to Gastonia, North Carolina because my father got a job at the Bridgestone Firestone plant as a environmental engineer and safety. He had a lot of hats, <laughs> well, safety hats too, um, in Gastonia, North Carolina, which is a small, it's a milled textile town right outside Charlotte, about like 20, 30 minutes down the 85 uh, main highway there. And um, so I started uh, doing soccer and t-ball um, and basketball with my two brothers. I have a twin brother and a younger brother who's two years younger. And we always liked climbing trees and things like that. So it was a, we were outside for hours like this time right now in the summer, riding bikes, doing all the outdoor things, reading outside, teaching myself how to do a cartwheel on the lawn, things just tons of that. Um, Cause back then we had like maybe eight channels on TV and like the antenna on the roof that went <laughs> in a dial. So there really wasn't much to see. And we never got cable until, I think my parents got cable when we left the house, like for college. <laughs> um, but we weren't really missing anything to be honest. Um, so I think around, yeah, around the age of seven, I started taking piano lessons, something different. And my dad uh, also uh, plays the piano. So he tried to teach me um, that plus French plus Arabic. My father's from, uh, he was born in Cairo, Egypt. And um, came, he, he graduated, <laughs> he took the test to go to college at the age of 16. Back then you just needed to take a test. Uh, you didn't need to graduate from high school. So he never graduated from high school actually, technically. He just went on to college, took the test and went in. So he graduated from the University of Cairo and then um, got, uh, came over to the States uh, with technically on a refugee visa actually between uh, different persecutions of Christians and, and Muslims at the time was having issues in Egypt still having issues, of course, but um, got to Richmond, Virginia, went to Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU, and got a master's degree, and then um, met my mom at a Catholic uh, ice cream social. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so he tried to teach me French and Arabic um, growing up, and the piano, and um, I eventually kind of wanted my own teacher because he was very, he's uh, he's a good teacher, but um, 
really, really hard worker. And I sometimes wanted to go outside and play a lot, <laughs> like climb those trees. Um, and so I got another teacher, um, learned the piano, did competitions and things like that, very minor things, nothing crazy. Um, and then got to dancing around the age of eight, I believe. Um, my dad just asked me one day, do you want to try a dance class? And I said, sure. So I took a ballet and tap combo class for like a 90 minutes, maybe it was. Um, loved it. And it was from a uh, gas and dance theater. Pat Wall started this beautiful school and like pre-professional company that's concert based out in this little mill town of Gastonia. And I was just so lucky to have had her. Um, and she, uh, they, they did um, full length ballets and also repertory concerts. The company I was a part of when I got to be 16 and stuff like that. So I saw my first ballet that I saw was, it was, it was graduation ball and I don't know if anybody quite from, I don't know the choreographer, but I remember it's, just, it's a comedic ballet. And there was just, it's the, it's the premise is like, there, it's like a finishing school and these girls, it's like a prom way back when prom and they, these girls meet these guys and they cut up just like teenagers do. And it was just very funny and it was ballet. And I was like, what is this thing? I love it. I made my dad take me twice. <laughs> so I saw it twice at Gaston College. And um, then I just, I was hooked. I wanted to be on the stage. I wanted to make uh, people feel happy and, and uh, relaxed and just uplift people's um, days and nights and whatever part of time the day was. But um, so ballet and tap went into more ballet. It was more a uh, ballet school, but we, she, Pat Wall, I mean, my gosh, she encouraged us to take everything. I was so lucky. I had a really great modern teacher, tap, um, jazz, and I started taking Pilates. One of my modern teacher, uh, who started actually the Pilates scene in Charlotte way back when, she, I was one of her, her guinea pigs. Um, she said something to the effect that probably like if, and Pat Wall said too, like, if you want to keep dancing till you're like my age, and I'm like, I don't know how old it is, but I know it's older than <laughs> me. Pilates is a good idea to start training in. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I started really loving how the body and body mechanics work and how to train safely and figuring out how it works for other people. So I'm Pilates certified too, of course. I got that um, under my belt when I was in Europe. Um, and I mean, I had classes by, she brought in Cleo Parker Robinson to do shows. So she she, she presented these amazing people in little Gaston College. Like, I mean, it's mind blowing now as a presenter, like what she did for this small town and um, of Gastonia. And um, so there's Cleo came, Chuck Davis came many times down the road. Um, we had Flamenco um, teachers. So whoever we didn't really have in the little town of Char Gastonia or could get from Charlotte, she would bring people in from school, North County School of the Arts as well. Um, for master classes, and we just just encourage us to take everything and anything and try everything. And so that has really stuck with me. And also just the openness that I had. I think also growing up, my father from Egypt, my mom being a uh, American, beautiful mutt that she is, and just very accepting of cultures. My uncle, who's my mom's sister, married an Italian. So there's just lots of multicultural kind of different ethnicities in my family and just just always being open trying from different foods to different music um different forms of communication things like that languages I can't speak fluently because I know a little bit of everything but um <laughs> uh that as well how to communicate um so I went many summers to North Carolina School of the Arts I think three total in my teens and then one in college. And while I was at School of the Arts, um, I had a friend, it was all for ballet. Cause at that time I was just like, it's ballet. It's just like, that's the biggest thing. Cause that's just kind of what I knew. I love contemporary and I did it well. And other people saw me shining in it, but I don't, it was just so, it's, it's everybody says, you know, it's just so ballet heavy at first. That's changing. Um, 
so I had a good friend of mine, she, um, who grew up dancing with me, she was taking modern, she got in from contemporary there. And so I, I was hearing her experiences in the contemporary program side, and she had this teacher, Mr. Chang, he was there that summer teaching, and uh, she loved him. She was like, he teaches ballet like I have never, ever experienced. And she's, she's super tall, very muscular, insanely strong. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, if Katie says this, this is, I got to go check out who this teacher is. So I, I watched from the doorway a few times, like where I could, and just to, to see Mr. Chang te teach. And I just, I, yeah, I, I wanted to be in there. Um, so that stuck with me when I was looking for colleges um, and knew that he was at TCU. And so TCU was on my list, Texas Christian. Um, NYU was on my list because it's New York. <laughs> um, uh, Utah University was on my list. I also applied to Carolina, NC State. Um, I feel like I definitely looked at some others but I think I got down to those five and um I my parents were like no New York it's just too much for us right now um <laughs> so and I've been going away for many summers I also went to Nutmeg Ballet um where I got really great Russian true Vaganova training which was insanely great um and met some good friends who I still know now uh same with Virginia School for the Arts I was lucky to go there one summer and meet other really great people too. Um, so I was used to going away for summers. And I think that's also helped me a whole lot just navigating college and living in Europe on my own that I, I grew up at the age of 13 for about six, eight weeks every summer, figuring out how to live on my own. Um, and I, I try and impress that upon my children, youth and everything. And like, it's such an important thing to try and just figure out how to manage your $20 a week or whatever allowance you've got. And, you know, um, you got to get to the dinner hall before it closes or you'll go hungry or you're going to eat. It. It's just, I, I think it's um, a really good thing to do um, to try and live on your own a little bit um, in a safe environment, something like that, that you're doing something that you love and that you have a passion for. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, cause I still have friends and I still have friends. Some of those friends have actually turned, have jumped into the circus world too. And they're still performing who I've met at the age of 13 and we're, it's, it, again, it's mind blowing. Um, but yeah, there's definitely friends I, I have re-met going, I know you. <laughs> and how did you end up, uh, in Europe? What were you doing in Europe? <laughs> okay. So I went to TCU after college. I just had this. My, my uncle, who's Italian, we have some family in the Tuscany area, and they're not blood related to me, but family, blood, you know, and um, I just always wanted to live in Italy. I had been dancing like long, long, long days, hardcore for many, or I guess 10 years at that time. And I kind of wanted a little bit of a, a break, not a complete cut off, but just a little bit of a break. And I just, I really wanted to take the next leap, kind of a sink or swim kind of situation. And, and somehow my parents were, were good with this because I, we have family and my mom's sister, like they know the area. I lived in Rome, which was only like an hour and a half kind of away train ride. But um, yeah, they were, they, um, I don't know if I would have been as as <laughs> as open, but they trusted me, and I I trusted myself to figure it out. So um, I hopped off the plane and um, lived in a hostel for like a week or so, and then just kept me trying to. Be, I met another American who was teaching at a school, a ballet school, so she helped me find um, a place to stay, stay with her for a little bit, and then one of my cousins. Um, Lebanese cousins. She also has a friend who um, now lives in New York, but she's half Italian, half Argentinian, Annabella Linzu. And she was living in Rome with her American husband at the time. And so they helped me tremendously find housing and things and showed me the ropes of the dance world there and like where to take classes and whatnot. And so, but I, I just took classes and I, 
was a tourist and then I blew a lot of money that I saved up um, <laughs> to go and I saw I kind of got a, a job doing being a tour guide for English speakers. So I love history and I love it when it comes more to life. So I was like your walking historian of the Roman fountains was my was my tour. That's the one I was assigned to. So at night around like seven at this time, we would start at Piazza Navona and wind our way around and end up um, at the overlooking the forum um, for the spectacular night view. So uh, I love I love that job. It was so it was so great to meet people from around the world. Um, and people would take our American tours English because we had a, not an accent. Um, so it would so I met Jap people from Japan, people from everywhere. It was it was so great to spend a couple hours and talking about something I love. Um, um, so art and, and all the arts and, and the hidden gems of Rome and everybody who built it in a sense. Um, I've had many jobs since then, like fundraising for the Dallas Chamber of Commerce, um, from working at a brokerage firm, the stock market, talking to Fortune 500 companies and CEOs and CFOs, and on convincing them to go down to Austin, Texas, to to meet with our clients. And I would set up limos and <laughs> all these event planning. Essentially, was what I was doing, and I didn't know it. Um, and, and where did you learn those skills? Did you learn it on the job? Is it like something that dance set you up for? Yeah, so I, one of my professors, Carrie Kreiman, um, got me kind of this first, my first job out of, um, well, I, I lied, I was teaching, not teaching, well, I was doing that too. Um, so many jobs. I was working as a bartender and ballet at the Bass Performance Hall in Fort Worth. Um, then I worked my way up to manager, so I, I learn the ropes on how to lead a team and, and do all that. But yeah, as I choreographed a lot in college, I also had four other cohorts and one in theater, um, no, two in theater, lighting designer, director, a uh, costumer, and then one of my roommates was marketing. And we created this show called Dimension that Shana was in. Um, and it was, we, it was an hour long show. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we created an hour long show on the side after we were doing all our other rehearsals um, my sophomore year. Uh, and yeah, uh, there was about 25 dancers who volunteered their time for us between ballet and modern. It was a joint world. It was, it was a futuristic show. Um, but yeah, so we, so I learned quickly kind of how to manage that. I had a passion for connecting people. Um, and so yeah, organizing people, uh, making connections, that I kind of is a thread throughout my life and a passion that I have, I think, that I keep coming to coming around to every time of what I like to do. Um, and so however means I need to do to do that, I will find the way, I guess. So yeah, work between CFOs and C like all that's all the things. Um but yeah, the discipline of dance and the, and the hard work schedule that goes with it um, and the organization that you have to have to, to have the job, get to the rehearsals and all the things and um, has helped me tremendously. To, yeah, to I've, yeah, I've seen my students' planners <laughs> and they're all type A people. So they have like highlighted every single minute of the day you know and it is like how we organize our lives is a particular type of choreography you know uh, and i love the way that dance you know is the mode through which we engage the world and so why should it look any different you know so you went to europe you went to tcu you graduated from tcu you mm -hmm. went to europe what what then happened? So while I was sightseeing around Europe, I got up to Brussels once and there was so much more kind of the contemporary dance side that I was looking for up there. So I came back for a, one of our TCU dance weddings, 
the answer to that wedding. And then I came, got a grant to go back to Brussels. So my first grant I got around the age of 23, I think it was, um, minus college grants, but this one I had to actually write and turn it into an arts council thing, um, to go back to Brussels to take workshops. So I moved to Brussels in, in January. Don't do that. Don't, don't move to Brussels in January. Um, it was real cold, but I managed to, yeah, I found a place to live in this, this uh, house and things like this um, and uh, met some really great people through the dance world again. And I started to meet people there from, I, uh, so there's an audition. Hmm. Nancy Carter's coming in from TCU soon, actually. There was an audition for a school, Salzburg Experimental Academy of Dance in Austria um, at one of the dance places that I would take classes. And I'm like, and they had a postgraduate program um, for choreography. It's just one year program. And I looked it up online. I saw like all these amazing international teachers and guests would come there. And the price was just, um, pennies in comparison to what uh, college is here. And of course our, our private school expenses were. And so I was like, uh, I'm just gonna audition for this and see what happens and then ask my parents. <laughs> so at the audition, Nancy Carter uh, knew, knew at this time, she was our secretary at TCU that I stayed in contact and still stay in contact with. She um, kept emailing me and saying, there's someone in Europe you've got to meet. This Elizabeth Farr, Libby Farr. And I'm like, okay, she's somewhere in Germany. Like, oh, like where am I gonna find this person? Um, so she's reading my, um, we're in bar doing plies. She's reading, going down the line, she's reading everybody's like uh, resumes and stuff. And she just, um, and I'm in a room with like, you know, a lot of people who don't speak English and I don't know yet. She's, she kind of sounds American, but she, I'm not really sure. She just said hi and got to it. So, but she was like, uh, I know Nancy. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Literally in the middle of class. So yeah, it was Libby Farr who was teaching that ballet class. He was like, I'll get you into this school. Like, no worries. And so, um, yeah, so I went down to Salzburg. Libby got me in. Again, a TCU connection across the seas. Just know your teachers, my gosh, and like befriend everybody because you have no clue who's going to help you out. It's just amazing. Absolutely. Um, don't, don't uh, be mean, be <laughs> loving, be respectful, everyone. Don't burn any bridges. Do not burn any bridges. You heard it here. Not first. Oh yeah, not first. Justine Ayala, who was my second interview, said that was her, one of her nuggets. And I was like, I totally agree with you. Um, and I taught her as a young age growing. It was crazy. So yeah. Um, so, oh my God, that's, the school was so amazing. And that year, uh, well, okay. So at that audition, David Posnanter, I met him and he was getting, he was getting in the circuit. He was circus. He can unicycle and juggle like crazy and all these things. And so he, he was the other American from, L, from LA. So it was me and him, the only Americans in the school from people literally across the world, Brazil, Japan, Israel, everywhere, Finland. Um, and um it was like it was the best time ever it was also during the re-election of george w bush uh, in in the gulf war and that was really crazy times to be an american over there um we made it through and we helped to other people to understand us a little bit better because and that was you know being flip side of the coin in a sense um it took so I had three roommates, a Turkish roommate, all students from the school that I just got paired up with because I needed a place to stay and ask the secretary, I need help. <laughs> uh, a girl from Croatia and um, uh, Catalonia, Spain. And so my friend Petra from Croatia, is, uh, there's many other people from this Slovenia and Slovakia and those countries and they really like knit it together. and while their languages were a little different, they could still communicate with each other in their native tongue. And so they, they really became like a little, a click. And I'm coming in not knowing anybody and that, like kind of as a senior. So all these people who've been there three plus or four years and an American during all this, all this political crazy time, 
And I'm like, I just want to dance. <laughs> What's going on? Why don't you like me? I didn't mean to be liked, but I was like, I like cohesion. I like community. And um, I was really struggling with like how to, how to, how to find, how to find that. Um, and, and David was too, but he was starting off uh, just as a first year. And so he was going to be there for four years. He had time. I had no time. And I had to like choreograph and use these dancers and they had to trust me somehow. And they couldn't get it. Some of them really just couldn't get past that. I was an American. Um, and that was real rough. Um, but so my roommate Petra, who was Croatian, she was helping. She's like, Caroline's cool. Y'all like calm down. Like just let her in. But between that, what happened to Yugoslavia and everything and everybody and there's many other things with Lebanon and my family because I went to Lebanon to visit that y'all there's just stigmas about Americans in the world that if you don't travel you don't know what that is and I beg of you to travel to experience what it's like and what other people really think of our country and it's especially good especially right now yeah there it's oof, I, oof, I, <laughs> Being over there right now, I wouldn't even be, get, I don't know. Um, it was rough enough to be there when Bush was president. Um, I can't imagine. Um, but so one of the girls from Slovenia, Kaya, she, <laughs> this was before it, like, it was the rad thing to like shake her head here and like dye this. And like, she, she, she was real intimidating, like, like big girl, like intimidating. <sighs> I was, I, I got homesick and I called my mom. I was like, how do you make your banana bread? I want to know how to make your banana bread. So I started make, I made banana bread and you know how banana bread, it's like smells up the whole <laughs> house. She walks into our apartment with, with Petra and she's like, who's making banana bread? I'm like, me? <laughs> like, don't hurt me. She was like, that's my mama's recipe. I was like, it's my mama too. So then we then we bonded over rap music and hip hop music i kid you not like we had the exact same taste of like from the and the house how they had that in slovenia i don't know but it's wild like we had the exact same playlist back then like cds um so yeah then we became best buds and contact improv with eyes closed she would throw me all around and full trust it was just amazing but it it took banana bread um and <laughs> and hip hop music <laughs> to break that ice and um yeah i you just never know but I, I would say just keep trying i just i i i don't like conflict um i know conflict is necessary for growth totally know that but i love um community um and trying to make that happen as much as possible in the tying thread behind all that um and bringing people together um yeah yeah it sounds like a theme that is <laughs> so important right now i mean when you interviewed me a couple weeks ago we were just learning about ahmad arbery yeah in um georgia and now of course we are learning and gaining more information about george floyd's awful experience um, I think that it's important to mention where we are um, and, you know, just like personally as an activist, I'm interested in using my creative genius as an artist to identify um, potential solutions mm -hmm. to issues and problems. And it sounds like you used, and I want to put it like as a bumper sticker, like banana bread and hip hop music as a way to connect cross generationally, right? Because you're, oh, yeah. you're you're older than this person, yeah. Um, as well as um, ethnically, certainly when we look at histories of Yugoslavia and Serbia. <clears throat> and Egypt mm -hmm. and Lebanon, um, that music and food are, or could be, um, 
ways of connecting in ways that um, could be revolutionary. And it sounds like it was in your experience at that time. Yeah, it completely was. Um, and I mean, there, there's the thing about breaking bread with somebody. There's the having shared experience. I mean, it's, having a meal with someone is a shared experience and art and everything, performance art or listening to music, however you want to, or making a piece of artwork together. That's a shared experience that connects you more than anything else. And there's science behind all of that. Um, that's that I love that there's science that's proven that psychologically, even in your brain. Um, and I think there, there's even some study that they did and I would have to look it up for you to, to quote it, but they, they, they monitor people's heart rates and beats in a theater setting. And you might know this, Adam. And people sync I do. up. Yeah. I mean, God, they, people sync up when you're watching a live performance. What craziness <laughs> is that? That whoever's in the audience, doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, what your ethnic background or socioeconomic, you're going to sync and become one for the amount of time that you're watching this and i think that's just the most beautiful sublime close to sublimeness that we could kind of get um on this earth as my personal opinion so. <laughs> yeah and that the arts that it's because of the arts like they're not watching a football game no i'm the yeah. son of a football player mm -hmm. you know no tea no shade on football mm -hmm. but it's not it's not a sporting event. Right. Right. It's not a birthday party. Mm -mm. It's not even church. Mm -hmm. It's not synagogue. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not going to a mosque. It is the arts that um, seem to bring people together literally, like on a physiological level that our cells are uniting and commingling and doing this with each other yep. um, as we have this artistic experience. And, um, you know, as we think about this current moment, certainly with COVID-19, and I'd love to hear more about um, your current work and how you got into circus and what, how you're having to shift because of COVID-19 and particularly around racism, mm -hmm. like how can the arts be the conduit for connection um, um, that actually is the um, initiator and the instigator of social change and community and breaking down those um, barriers that are, <clears throat> Um, that have been told about us that are historically inaccurate. Yeah, uh, all of <laughs> all those things. Um, I'm going to weave them in, but I think I will just go back to your question about circus because I think it comes back to circus for me. All those things. Um, so at Salzburg, uh, my friend David had he he got a sear wheel, which is this huge metal hoop thing, hoop at device apparatus that's on the floor. And you kind of like spin around the out like a coin, right? I want to learn how to do that. Oh my God. You would look so amazing. <laughs> um, it's, it's on my bucket list. I mean, I've, been, I've worked on it a little bit, but I need more time. I need my own wheel. But um, he is named after a, name, a guy named Daniel Sear, which I hope to have on my series sometime this year. And um, he self-taught, David self-taught him this, his, how to do seer. I, I was just amazed. And he, I touched it and I was like, oh God, no, this is scary. <laughs> I'm like, because you can knock yourself out. Um, it's steel. So he took me to my first contemporary circus um, in somewhere in Austria, in some field, in some tent. It was an Italian choreographer. I know, I know, right? So, like, he just kidnapped me, um, the best friend in the world. And he, um, uh, it was an Italian choreographer working with circus artists. And I'm like, uh, okay, 
this is fascinating. Um, so we went and I can't even tell you, there's no programs. I have nothing. I just have the visual, like it was in a tent. There was like maybe five performers or so. And there's this one girl who's about my height. I'm about five, four, everybody. And she was just like hanging off a Chinese pole and like flying around the air, like the strongest thing I've ever seen out of this out of woman. And I've seen strong female dancers and I love the acrobatic contemporary side of things. And that's what I was doing at um, uh, Salzburg, Austria. And I loved all of that stuff, like with Batasheva company and like choreographers like that. But like, this was a whole different thing and all. And the how the choreographer wove a really great story into it it was not like i only seen ringling brothers cirque du soleil wasn't really out in the states yet or anything like that At, around this is around i graduated college in 02. i had never heard of cirque du soleil ever it, i got home and back to the states like in 05, 06, and um was starting to kind of hear about this so i, I just missed there's things I miss by being in Europe, that's for sure. <laughs> like, I, I, I want, there's some shows I'm like, hmm. um, and also, well, I TCU again, okay, TCU. We had this professor uh, named Doc, her name was Dr. Manning, Keitha Manning, and she said, like, the next big thing is aerial dance. This is in like 2001, too, like I said, and I'm like, what's, what's aerial dance? Aerial? She's like, just go to the show. So I drove myself to Dallas, Texas all the time. I would go to Titus and see shows. Um, some, sometimes I would take somebody with me if somebody wanted to go, but I went so many times by myself and drove to Dallas to see shows. And I loved working at Bass Performance Hall because I would bartend and then go watch the show and then come back out. It was the, the, oh, the best job. So um, uh, I saw Brenda Angel Aerial Dance Company from Argentina. That was my first aerial dance show in college at probably like, oh, 2001. They were doing Argentine tango with bungees and harness in the air. And I, I was like, actually, no, it was probably 99 because I wanted to put it in the show I mentioned. And I came back. I was like, how, how can we rig in um, that little theater on that university theater on campus? Because that's where our show where they're like, no, no, that's not happening. I was like, what? Okay. All right. All right. I'll figure it out another point in my life. Just like filed it back there. And then I saw the circus show in Salzburg, Austria, and I wanted to start flying at <laughs> Salzburg. And they're like, no, nah. like, okay. <laughs> so I just, and then I got back to Charlotte. Um, I started the Charlotte Dance Festival because there wasn't anything happening like that in Charlotte. And so I wanted to have a platform for choreographers to come in to share and all and, and share works. And then, um, I had a good friend, Juliana Hain, uh, who's back in the area now. She hearts to help me start the festival and she was getting into aerial dance. So we started working together at uh, a rock climbing gym here called Inner Peaks and on harness work. And cause she was a rock climber. So we met a rigger friend named Jay Young who taught us how to rig and he would do rigs for us. Um, our first event uh, that I got my company dancers to do was me. Kate McDonald uh, and Christina Kelly. We, the year is 2007. I will never forget it because it was the year that all event planners wanted to do 007 events. And so we were James Bond girls <laughs> hanging, hanging in the Wells Fargo, was now the Wells Fargo, was Wachovia Atrium, which is this huge dome. We were hanging up there for like a hour and a half or so sitting on like this this swing that he made us and then we rappelled down and did dance upside down and then we got to play on the escalator as Jane Bond's girls things you don't you know and so we rehearsed there after hours with security it was hilarious um and then our next gig was on the outside of an elevator shaft on a mall for um uh Carolina Place Mall we danced on the outside of that elevator shaft for Black Friday this was when you actually got to Black Friday at like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, not like the Thanksgiving day. Um, and that was with a band underneath us playing some Black Eyed Peas song. I don't, it was just super fun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I got my first apparatus was rope and harness, then went into silks, aerial silks. 
Uh, and Juliana just would teach me. There's a great uh, mime dance circus friend in town, Hardin Miner, who had um, a warehouse um, with no AC, no HVAC, no nothing. It's a warehouse. There was a big beam up there that we got a plate, metal plate, steel plate that we drilled into the concrete. Um, it was maybe ooh, 14 feet off the floor, 12, maybe 12. And so, which is fine when you start off, you're not going far from the ground. <laughs> There's a lot of static movement on the silks, right? We had some, some pads, some like mats or something like this. Um, and Juliana would, she knew stuff, so she taught. And then we would just kind of figure out stuff. We'd explore this apparatus, because she was a dancer too. She graduated from Winthrop University. And so we just explored it like, and other dancers, we explored these things like um, a dancer would explore a prop. prop and safely on the floor. And all the things I bought Pilates and I got certified Pilates at, in Salzburg and gyrokinesis. Um, I got certified in Europe as well with that. Um, and all those things, we were just very body, and she's also certified in Pilates, just really body mind focused so that I don't recommend self-teaching yourself, but we were, had many degrees in dance and physiology of things that we could like understand, yeah, that's probably not a good way to put your leg. Let's, let's find another alternative. So there are still moves that we created that's in our syllabus that um, from playing around um, and, uh, it, and things I call certain dance moves just like, because it, it's, it's my, the vocabulary I did. I can't, I grew up with. So I also started creating syllabus from, from the big ballet background and from pedagogy at TCU and everything. It's just like in, in the Pilates training, you need a syllabus. So I started writing things down and trying to figure out progressions immediately. Um, Cause shortly after there's some people, small friends who wanted classes. And um, I was like, well, I'll teach you these few things. Cause I don't want you to like to, hang a curtain on your banister and go to town and we'll do it safely here when the weather is decent because this is no age back there's anything like that it was in abandoned cotton mill in charlotte called the hawthorne mill now i think it's renovated but like there was all these like crazy props from like a halloween carnival thing back there dark like there's one light it was also with one of those like really meaty gems where you like throw tires so on the other side, we hear <gasps> boom, as we're like trying to do stuff. And we had like a, there was no bathroom. You, they, the gym wouldn't let us use their bathroom. There was a bathroom way, if you really had to go, way far back in the caverns of this mill that you took a flashlight with and your own toilet paper. And there was a very harmless homeless man there who said, hi, like, yeah, that was my beginnings of circus. Um, after one winter, we were like, we need a place with heat. So we found um, Christina, one of my dancers, her husband at the time was working at Best Buy and he met this guy at Best Buy who was a gymnastics gym right near the border, actually technically on South Carolina where the theme park is called Carolina Stars. And so he's like, my wife and her friend need to place because <laughs> it's so cold. And so, yeah, then I, we were at a gymnastics gym for about four or five years and got to the rock climbing gym as well. They allowed us to rig there when they got a bigger space and could carve out a little, little space for us to have some fabric. So we, we worked in there and we would create shows. So I, the company started as a contemporary dance company, Caroline Collusion Company. And then two years in, I met Juliana, we started doing aerial and we started adding aerial into the shows very minor um and then so we would create dance portions of the show in dance studios aerial in like the hawthorne mill or the gymnastics gym and then come on the stage and try and figure it all out um i have a lighting and scenic designer who's been with me for 13 of my 15 seasons she just missed the first two shows um because I didn't know her at that time. She lit my first aerial dance festival. So I, I did an aerial dance festival uh, concert as part of the Charlotte Dance Festival. That was a year I also presented Chuck Davis too, which was just an honor to like, as a child, like seeing him and then bringing in. Yeah, I have somewhere. He gave me a gift at Soundstairs actually. So I'm so lucky that I have something from Baba Chuck. Um, 
yeah. So I had an aerial dance concert with, and then Baba Chuck at the same time, and it was in a contemporary dance company <laughs> concert. It was great. Um, so yeah, uh, I learned some stuff there from from air, uh, just people who would come into town with Cirque du Soleil. Not that I knew who they were. Um, <laughs> would find me and they offer classes like Tanya Burka, who I also interviewed on this. She just emailed me out of the blue, like, Hey, you want a class? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, plus Christine Van Lu, who came with uh, Cirque de la Symphony, who performed with the symphony, who travels around the world. She also just found me out of the blue and offered to train, teach classes. I'm like, thank you, you generous people. And so this was like my mid twenties and as like a dancer, mid twenties, you start like feeling your body a little bit more aches and pains and you start wondering when's it time to retire. Do people want to see an old person on state stage? I'll get to the word old. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think circus really saved me in a sense that I ageism, is not a thing. Um, and I started doing all this at the age of 27, starting to fly and in, in different kind of training. And now it was a curveball, and I thought I was strong from all the athletic dancing I was doing, but it's different muscles, it's different things, but I love it, I love a challenge. Or I'm stubborn, one of the two. You can choose sometimes <laughs> the word to call me. But um uh the community behind circus too the insane acceptance and how you train and how you um really cheer each other on that is lacking a lot in the dance world it's better in the contemporary world but not to the degree that circus is and so that's something and i, I love my childhood i love going to gasoline theater and tcu but it was it's still hard like hard mentally on you sometimes and I it's gotten a hell of a lot better a hell of a lot better with mental health for artists and dancers and because you're in front of a mirror a whole lot you're looking at the clay that you have to sculpt as a performer and find a way to be good with that be okay with what it what it is that you have and that's in what you have and not somebody else doesn't have and you're you're trying to figure out what healthy competition is versus bad competition in your mind that's all a, a big challenging struggle and what i want to create is a school and a community with this circus inspiration behind it that we all have these great features about us and um sharing those is 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 just will help you will help you grow as a person you're not going to be able to lift your leg like somebody else over there but you're going to lift it in a different way that that person can't and to help train young dancers with that mentality um is kind of a vocation that i'm, I'm still working on um with all of my teachers and myself on how how to do that but I hope it can keep people dancing longer and that they don't feel like it was a childhood hobby that they have to stop. And you know, that's, yeah. I see that so sad in adults who come back to us like, Oh, I danced growing up and I'm so glad this is here. And I feel, I'm like, Oh, don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. But it's, it's a culture change that's going to take some time. Right. Yeah. You know, as you know, I've worked with Amy Christian over at Wiseful, New Mexico. Yeah. And I so appreciate the culture of circus and certainly the social justice nature of circus that we're finding more and more um, uh, made visible. Um, so I... I've always been interested in circus and I've, I've done a little bit with Frida Austin. Do you know Frida Austin here in Fort Worth? Texas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. She's the bomb. Yes. I took my first aerial class with her. I was like, oh yeah, I'll be back. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sore. I don't think I'm ever going to come back. <laughs> but if um, I, like, do you hold like summer training for adults? Can I come down to Charlotte and come study with you for a couple of weeks? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I'm I would really love interested to. in circus, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, we totally do from ages six, um, six, if we know you cause of COVID right now, but, yeah. um, cause you gotta keep that kind of mask on. Totally. Um, to our oldest adult right now, I think is 62. Um, so wow. every age in between. Yeah. Come, cool. come on up. Great. And what's your website again? It's Charlotte Cirque and Dance Center, cltcirquedancecenter.org. Amazing. I'm totally going to check it out. Yes, I'm so inspired by uh, your leadership and your vision uh, for circus arts and dance. Uh, so I'm going to speak as my younger self, let's say as my 19-year-old self. Yeah. And I hear this from my current students, um, like, I really want to do this thing. What do I do? How do I start? Um, I have a vision for my leadership in this field, but I, I like, I want to go to New York, but I don't know where to go. What would you share to young, young people who are in the brink of uh, their leadership in the field and their careers and or what would you share to your younger self that you think your younger self should know? Um, I'm going to take a note from Remy last couple of weeks ago. She was a young dancer who dances with AVT now and do your homework, do your research. I could have done a little bit more research um, when I was trying to go to Europe, but the internet was still kind of new at that time. It was really rough to get. Now there's no excuse. There's either you've got so much information at your fingertips to do great research and research online, but also research talking to people like I did with my friend Katie to find out Mr. Chang to take me to there and, and keep talking to Nancy Carter, who got me to Libby to got me to Salzburg. Like, talk to people, find out, who, I still do it. I, I was doing it today, talking to people like, who do you know? How, I want to do this. Help me figure out who's the best person to, to get me to do that. I still do it. Um, but yeah, I've learned other people um, will, are glad to help you out to make connections, to get things going, not just for you, but for the community, your, your project that you're wanting to do. Um, and, but yeah, do your research, talk to people um, as part of your research, like what do they recommend and their experiences, find out what they went through. And it could be like, well, I don't want to make that mistake. They're going to tell you that, or, you know, or that's a good idea. I'll look into that too. Um, good and bad, but take it all, take it all in. Yeah. Uh, what's the hardest thing that you've ever done uh, in the air? Ooh. Hardest thing I've ever done in the air. Uh. <laughs> I mean, there's some moves that are quite hard. A lot. Um, I love duo trapeze and, and partnering, duo lira partnering a lot, um, whether it's on the ground or in the air. Um, cause you're in the air supported by someone who's below you. So I can kind of consider that aerial. Um, so there's definitely moves that you have to have a lot of trust that you will commit to what you're going to do, that you're not going to bail on whatever you're supposed to do. Cause when it could hurt you and it could definitely hurt your partner. Um, so there's trust in yourself, which is huge. And that's just, once you overcome that and you, you, you can do something amazing like with somebody else and it's 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 just like the biggest rush it's huge mm. the other aerial thing was a couple years ago i got to do my first building dance uh 70 80 feet in the air on a building in charlotte we were the first to perform on a building and um that was that was also very challenging because i had to work with the city of charlotte a museum wells fargo and yeah that was it yeah but that was three big uh and and a foundation to get money for it of course because <laughs> it was free to for the public to see but yeah dancing 70 80 feet in the air on um a surface uh 
that we can't rehearse on necessarily in our studio. Um, we don't have enough ceiling height and a beam that's close enough to a wall to really get the sensations right. that you would have with so much rope. Um, yeah, so we did the very best we can. We got a good teacher to show us as much ropes, ropes to say it, tricks, um, and then got on the building and used all our dance skills that we have to like, again, explore this new apparatus in a different, old, I was the one I started with, so I really loved going back to it um, and, and exploring it in a different way. But yeah, the nerves of taking that first step off the building from way up there, that was the hardest, step after that it was a blast i could not stop smiling there's pictures it's like planted not because it was funny but it was just i know i was just super i don't know it was so i was so thrilled um to be doing that uh type of dancing um i was just ex it's ecstatic inside um yeah, it sounds almost euphoric it was yeah yeah it was super Super fun. Um, there was also one point that my parents came. They loved it. My mom was a little bit more nervous than my dad. My dad was just like a kid in a candy shop. Like this is like he had the biggest smile on his face when I we had two groups, so I could watch my other group and I could stay on the ground to help uh, music and stuff. But he just loved watching uh, the group. But my mom, so I took a it was an old camera that I had uh, iPhone. So I took it with me down um, to do a video to like here world. This is what I see um doing this and my mom's coming down the stairs she's like be safe up there <laughs> I was like, of yes, course. Mama. <laughs> that's what moms do it was perfect <laughs> yeah so it sounds like you you are doing like pretty major work um and collaborating with foundations and cities and uh businesses um any any advice in having to uh, collect with these entities who don't know dance, who don't know circus arts? Like, you know, what if there are those artists that are listening who are really interested in um, collaborating with civic entities who may not um, have experience working with artistic entities? Ooh, that's almost another whole conversation. But in a nutshell, you have to build your reputation. And I, that goes back to being as, you know, uh, thoughtful, as much uh, thoughtful and open and doing a, showing up and doing a good job every time, the best job you absolutely can and being nice to the crew if there's any crew that's around, um, helping you rig, um, being nice to any sound, lighting, not just the person who hired you, but everybody else, um, so that they are like, you know that person, they were really nice um, performer. I wanna work, like, yeah, bring them back, <laughs> work with them again. I, um, event planners, um, everybody um, that you meet when you step into a venue um, is, is a potential new door an opportunity um for you and you don't know when that might might appear in your lifetime um but there's definitely people who saw us at this event or worked with us before and now work for somebody else and they got us this and that and whatnot um so but you have to you, got, you have to earn it there's there's many years this company's been around for almost 15 years and we started doing aerial through the recession um, in 07. So um, showing up and showing up, doing the best job you possibly can. And if there's anything that, you know, fell through the cracks, like the event planner wanted you to wear blue and you wore purple, you didn't get the memo or whatever happened, you, you know, you graciously apologize and try and figure out how to fix it, if you can fix it. Um, and show up and keep knocking on doors. There's more doors are going to sh shut and say no, um, than doors that open. I, 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 I don't know what the percentage is, especially right now. I'm trying, I keep, I told my husband today, I was like, I'm just throwing a lot of things out there and seeing 
what will stick with different partners here and there because everybody's in a different place right now as far as their comfort level for doing things and financial level, not just like health level, but financial level um, and audience and all these things. So it's, it's building for the future, um, future partnerships of what that might look like. Um, but yeah, yeah. It sounds like you have to throw out like lots of darts <laughs> and hope that one of them hits a target. Um, but if you don't throw out the darts, then nothing will. Nothing's going to hit. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some saying like that too. Yeah. If you don't even try, like you're definitely not going to get the job. So yeah, you've got to throw it out there. Um, and, yeah. and, and you know, throw it out there in the most respectful way possible. And there's art, you know, there's art within event planning and there's, there's gigs and type of art that we won't do. Um, so I'm selective on that just, um, because I want right, to, like my, you can say no too. Yes. Like, yeah, don't. Okay. Yes. Learn to say no, like doing things for exposure and it sets you at the bottom of the barrel. And it also pulls down everybody else who's trying to do that. So if you go do a gig for like 50 bucks, whatever kind of artwork it is, and you're there for four hours, um, you know, and you have a college degrees and all these things and you're you're also setting that bar super low for anybody else and trying to raise that bar is really hard for everybody else um luckily in charlotte me and other event artists here um we have come to an agreement there's a minimum that and we won't undercut each other and that's i'm so grateful for the other artists here in charlotte who won't do that for corporate events um, we have to worry sometimes about outside artists that they'll go, if they'll go find somebody else, but like, yeah, um, there's right. A, like if you don't think you have value, then other people won't think you have value. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, mm. yeah. And that's hard to learn as an artist. Um, I, it's a kind of a psychological thing that you have to figure out that you are worth something and that something is not pennies like in you think about um there's some workshop i did trying to it was like writing for grants i think it was to try and figure out your budget <laughs> and they are telling us artists like to always think about how many years have you been training for this it's not like four like how some people go to a college and they take a business they get a business degree and they've been training for it for four years. Now you've been doing this since you were eight. So I've been doing this art form. I've been training for all of this for decades. I'm 40 now, you know, 32 years. And that's worth a whole, like that, that's a lot. Um, you've got How many tondus do you think you've done? <laughs> no, I didn't talk to, oh my God. I don't even know. I, a yeah. dollar a tondu. Right. <laughs> and then there's within reason, of course, what people can afford. But, um, <laughs> yeah, totally. but right. I mean, there's, you have to think about how long you've been doing it, what your, your skill set are and all these things um, to try and find, but you are, you are worth, you're worth the money. Don't, mm. don't undercut yourself ever because it's going to be hard to come back or not be able to come back up from that from that thing from that that level right once you once sounds you've like a nugget just gonna <laughs> grab the nugget <laughs> grab that nugget right here i know that rebecca's here and shane is here and Kristen is here want to give them an opportunity to voice themselves um as they like. There's the chat here. You can also unmute and uh, start your video. Um, I'm thinking about Elizabeth Streb's work too, Caroline, Ooh. if you're mentioning the dance on the building. Yep. Just a shout out to Elizabeth Streb. Hey, Shayna. Yeah. I saw Elizabeth Streb. So I would volunteer at Joyce Theater anytime I went to New York to see things for free. Love it. And I stood next to her mama <laughs> during the show. And she's like, that's my girl. I was like, oh, yes, I ma'am. I love that. I love yeah. that. <laughs> there Who's might gonna... be things on Facebook, too. I don't know. Uh, 
there might, if anybody's on Facebook watching, you have questions, throw them in a chat over there and maybe Kristen will, find, I don't know how that works. Cool. Kristen is amazing. She'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, Caroline, I definitely have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, since I've known you, I feel like you have constantly been pushing towards the next project and um, you always go about it in the best way possible. Starting when I met you in college, you were always making amazing friends and setting everything up and like you said, doing your research and um, just being so purposeful in all of your next steps. So what is the next step? What, what is something that you have on your bucket list that you're researching in the background that, you know, you're hoping to work and I'm not making you promise that it's going to happen because we all know that sometimes you dip your toe in a water and then you end up doing something else. But, yeah. but what, what, what's, what are you thinking about? Um, so I've been working on this show, The Nightingale, and we did a version of it years ago with, with youth, but there's another version of it, which kind of actually, when I thought about it the other day, is echoing dimensions, which is, because The Nightingale is artificial versus authentic. And we want to take it with into like a virtual realm, which is what dimension was. So it's really ironic that I'm kind of going full circle back to the first show, full, first full length show I ever created um, and working, but now we have like new technology with, with projections and things like this. And um, so we're working on that. Um, hopefully spring 2021, it was supposed to be this spring, but I needed more time to research and get the technology right and the experience right for the audience. Cause it's going to be hopefully more of a, like an, an art installation where the audience moves around to different pockets of the stage for all the, the projections and the interactions with the artists and the, in the things. So there's a lot of work with that. Um, I think I hope to start it this summer actually, cause I, we did receive a grant from the local arts council. Finally, it's hard to always hard to write about new ideas without having visuals for them. So sometimes it's been taking me actually a couple of years to get funding for, for, for pieces. Um, I love to bring back my Carmina Barona and do it with full orchestra and choir. Uh, there is a collaboration in the works. It was maybe supposed to be this year, um, 2020, but it was a venue. We need a big venue for all of that um, lovely sound. So that's in the works as well. Um, I want to get back on the building, the Mint Museum, and do collaborate with some of their visual artists who have um, art in there to do projections on. It's a great facade to have projections and interactive art dancing with it as well. Um, those are my immediate ones um, that are probably going to take a little bit more time with our current situation to, to get going. But oh, and then my dream facility, that's also on the list that's coming near. So a big facility that is the Charlotte Circan Dance Center and all its lovely name um, that has a bigger theater, has flying trapeze rig inside, a lawn outside to take shows outside, dance studios. But also, I love uh, the format that Dogtown Dance Theater in Richmond, Virginia has. I don't know if y'all know about that place, but a friend of mine, Jess, she, she created and runs it. And there's so much multicultural. There's like, there's capoeira happening. There's, there's even pole classes. There's just like Latin. There's so much happening in all these little rooms. When you go down this old high school that's there and we performed in there, which was the old gymnasium. That's where the theater is. And it's just, it's, it's so inspiring to, um, so I hope one day to have that. And so that, cause there's a need for a space in Charlotte for dance and circus, um, studio space, performance space that's made for, for these art forms. Um, that's not like a, a small box um, in all the things, poles and y'all know the things that we try and dance on and with <laughs> on a stage. Um, so yeah, um, a big facility, um, not near like the center of that town, but in a, in a neighborhood that could like, I love the neighborhood that we're in right now. It's really a big mix 
of community. Also, social economics is somewhere around where we currently are um, right now so that we can be a neighborhood um, center. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's the big buckets right now. <laughs> They're kind of big uh, and they just said all that. <laughs> that's so great. What a great question, Shana. Thank you so much. Uh, Caroline, it's one thing I've learned about you during this time is that it seems that you are in it for the long haul, that, um, that your vision is long term, that you actually have to think 20 years out, that the, your create might take two to come to fruition, both because of the creative process um, and also because of funding and just of the way of the art world. Yeah. And I'm so inspired by your vision for um, everything you bring from your um, dance history to the forefront of this circus present, circus and dance present. Um, and I can't wait to come down to North Carolina and to learn from you um, and Thank to you. also think with you about how to support your vision for this uh, center that you're talking about. It sounds really, really exciting and um, certainly um, there's a need for it, you know. Yeah, I, I try not to get too excited because I know it's, it's in the near possible, you know, long for, I don't know, we don't know, but like, um, it's so exciting the the ideas and plans that I have. Um, I just want to get there as soon as possible, but I know it's, I'm trying to have patience. I'm yeah, <laughs> I get it. And you said you don't want to get too excited, but like, if you're not going to get excited about, I, excited about it, who will? I know. Right. Like right. we actually have to demonstrate our passion, especially as artists, right? Like that's what we can count on for the world. Like we get to enrich and invite um, a sense of hopefulness and excitement around what it means to be alive. And I think that um, that is the essence of um, what we do as artists and what art can offer the world, especially right now, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I know we're very torn and there's lots of justified anger and I am as well. Um, totally. It's, it's totally justified. It is also, we're tired of it. We're tired of, of having to feel this way every so often so I hope I hope we can make some big changes with all that's happening so that we can be a community again yeah. um, but, but it's lovely to see that we are a community when these protests are happening I do enjoy I mean it's 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 lovely to see people coming together people people not and some of our politicians and local government here are coming with us too which is great so it's you know um, there is community it uh, I'm not, there's divide, but also community at the same time. And I know community is going to win. Um, it will. Because. Totally. And so. thank you for your commitment to community and uh, both personally, but also professionally um, and what you're doing with your school and company. It sounds like uh, we are up, Kristen. I know we're over. Thank you for posting to Facebook Live. Um, this is Adam McKinney of DNA Works. Check out our website, dnaworks.org, hashtag DNA Works Arts. Thanks, Caroline, for this opportunity for me to get to know you better. And I'm going to send you an email right now about your adult programs, and I'm going to start stretching and getting my leg up a little bit. Uh, oh, I can't <laughs> wait. For the training. <laughs> and we have some uh, seer and stuff here for you to try as well. So there is one cool. running around. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm on sir. It. I'm on it. I'm on it. All right, team.
Thank you everybody for joining us. I truly appreciate you here and who's ever on Facebook. Thank you world. Thank you. Be safe. Love each other. Be kind to each other. Thank you, Adam. Such a pleasure. See you later. Bye. Bye.